Um, so this is Edward Padilla. Padilla. That's how you say your name. Say your name. Ed, Mr. Ed Padilla. And Mr. Ed. It says right there, Mr. When's Ed. Your birthday? January 26, 1954. And what is your current address? I live here in Brainton at um, 2901, um, 26th Street West in um, Bradenton at uh, the uh, Rain Tree Apartments. And I already forgot everyone's last name, but we have Carlton Cartwright, President, Harper County, Lenny, Josh Lenny, Josh Harper, Ian and Fife. Fife. And Brooke Taylor is not here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Have we started yet? Yes. Okay, okay, yes, good job. Sorry. All right. I wasn't sure. So which, which, branch of, which branch of service were you? I was in the Army. And what years did you serve? I served from uh, February 1978 through November 1983. I got an early out because I had accumulated uh, enough uh, free time. And I exercised my uh, ETS and the term service because there was really nothing going on. And I decided to... Uh, to start my civilian life. Where, where were you when you entered the service? I was in Los Angeles, California, in a place called Azusa, California. It's in the East Valley of Los Angeles, otherwise known as East Los Angeles. I'm Mexican-American, but I, I, I truly have to tell you that I'm Southern Californian. It's a separate attitude. And in those days, I uh, decided there wasn't really anything going on in 1977, but disco, uh, so I decided to join the Army. What were you doing prior to the service? I was working in a factory making sprinklers for Rainbird Sprinkler, and I loved that job. And I was confronted with the possibility that I would stay there 20 years, and that was unacceptable because I thought I had other things I wanted to achieve in my life. Where did you enter into the service? In um, Wilshire Boulevard, AFES, Los Angeles, California. It was a blast, the day before at least. Where was basic training? <laughs> Fort Linwood, Missouri, 175. Um, a bull's arc, nothing. <laughs> what were you on? Um... Combat engineer. Okay, and how long was that training? How long was boot camp? Boot camp was a, the, the standard eight weeks, and it was OSIT, one unit station training, uh, following my um, combat engineer training, which I became a, a demolition specialist. I was 12B10, C14 tour, Claymore, Bangalore, shape charge, crater charge, low anti tank. Um, anti-personal, anti-tank, you name it, I blew it. Okay. And um, after that training, where'd you go? I went to Hawaii, 25th Infantry Division, Fort Schofield Barracks, sorry, Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. Um, again, there wasn't really anything going on. I fell into the Grenada, uh, Lebanon category of war conflict, but we were there strategically to defend the Western Pacific uh, arena of combat, and that was my mission. How long were you there? I was there two years to the day. Uh, June 8th, 1978. Sadly, June 8th, 1980. Were there any casualties? Oh, no. Well, I was a casualty. Uh, when I was in the Kahuka Mountain Range, as we were in a training exercise, I um, injured my knee, for which I had orthopedic surgery. Two years later, um, I've yet to claim it, but we're working on it. But um, other than that, I had a good experience in Hawaii. I was an all-army all runner. I ran marathon, half marathon, uh, and I was on the Army track team. Uh, we, we, we filled our time with a lot of athletics and competitions waiting for, some, for an assignment. I was deployed one day in April. As you may remember, uh, during the Carter administration, we had a little accident in, in the Iranian desert with a bunch of helicopters. Uh -huh. I was deployed for 12 hours in defense of that. Uh, they aborted the mission subsequently because of that attack, and that would have been my only thrill my deployment. Were there casualties there? There absolutely was. As you remember, I believe there was eight uh, casualties on the ground in Iran. Oh. Otherwise, it was a really good tour. Two years in Hawaii. Uh, I, I was, all, although I was a combat engineer, I did a little boxing. I ran for the division. Uh, I was actually the seventh runner out of 1,500 uh, people who applied for the running program. I was proficient in my MOS and I also got an additional MOS of 71 Lima, which is clerk typist, and I was the colonel's driver. 
and assisted the headquarters company in, in the mission's logistics. How did you get along with officers and enlisted? Well, at the end of my tour, they called me Ed. Say what? At the end of my tour, they called me Ed. Prior to that, it was Sergeant Padilla. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I made the sergeant in 30 months, made BNOC. I was an outstanding combat soldier, I thought. And in my second enlistment, I re-enlisted re for call, um, behavioral science specialist and graduated from the Academy of Health Science, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, as a behavioral science specialist. Subsequently got my degree in social work, uh, social science, excuse me. After my tour, uh, ETS, I became a counselor in Arizona. Subsequently became certified in dual diagnosis, alcohol and drugs specifically, and reciprocity in 48 states, and I retired after 34 years in 2016. Congratulations. My first experience with PTSD was 1980. Uh, they didn't call it that then. To this day, I'm still working on it, okay. among other things. Okay. Did you take any R&R while you were um, throughout? When did you go in there when you are R&R? It was, it was interesting to be in Hawaii because you're already an R&R, &R, and since there wasn't any conflict, I enjoyed the beast. But what I really enjoyed is when I was uh, a part of the Army running team is they did deploy us, well, if that's the word you want to use, uh, to Maui and other parts to run for the Army. But obviously, I, I had not, not only my duties as a 71 Lima clerk type, I really enjoyed demolition. It's kind of interesting uh, in that kind of training is you learn how um, explosive work, C4 and TNT, and, and detonating of those uh, specific ordnance. Uh, and I think it's important for everybody to know that it is, is part of a combat. Not only the combat engineers, but other um, boots on the ground, 11 Bravo, know those kind of ordnance, as well as the Marines. We trained together at uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Isn't that training? It's ordnance, correct? Yep. Well, it's most ex hand explosive. Were there a lot of casualties, any casualties? Well, the only one I remember, it, it, I did recall that somebody spoke of somebody uh, getting hurt in, in basic training. But, you know, I think in collateral, as well as basic training instance, they can be expected because we're training. I, I had never, other than my knee, I had another any training. I will say that it was detrimental to my hearing because I always like going to the firing range, shooting my rifle. Right. You make any close friends? Um, I have one close friend that I still hang out with, and I remember I went in 1978. Uh, he's in Reno, Nevada, and uh, he actually had an opportunity to go to combat, and he doesn't talk too much about it. I'll try to get him to talk about it, but that's, that's another thing I do anyway, is try and get people to talk about it. I, today I, I'm um, not only a graduate of Academy of Health Science, I went on to be a, a career um, social worker, so to speak. I work with human services in many categories in diverse communities, Hispanic. I'm bilingual, I speak Spanish. Um, but at the same time, I also worked in the inner city with African Americans, in particular the Indian Reservation in Southwest Arizona with the Quitson tribe and many of the moieties of the Colorado River after my tour of duty as a counselor. Those skills were very, very uh, instrumental in me, me being successful in my career as a counselor and later on as an administrator. Uh, from, from that point on, I've been administrator in programs in Reno, Nevada, um, Yuma, Arizona, and here in uh, Bradenton, Florida, as well as Sarasota, by the way. Can you recollect all the countries that you visited while you were in the service? Well, uh, the first one, obviously, and it, it, it wasn't overseas duty, and I didn't think it was overseas, but it was Hawaii. Okay. Um, after that, I chose to stay in the States, and I was in Texas, and I was in Arizona, and I was in California, and Nevada. Um, my eat, my um, TDYs were also Florida, Arizona, Texas, uh, so they did mostly Southwest. Um, I, again, I, I didn't have um, the same experiences as my wartime counterparts in Vietnam. Uh, let me tell you something about that. Um, my brother joined, my cousin joined. My father is a veteran of the Luzon. General MacArthur came back as my 13 uncles came back, which is just outstanding, from North Africa to the South Pacific. 
So I come from a, a very proud military family. My daughter will be leaving for the Navy here shortly. Um, and so regardless, and I've never been criticized, I will tell you that, because I didn't go to combat. It's my passion and my dedication uh, to the service that, that made me the soldier I was. Uh -huh. And that's what caused me to re-enlist into an occupation that was atypical as a counselor. So my first counseling experience was we were veteran Vietnam soldiers. I got two questions. I definitely got the impression of your um, your diverse background, family, um, so the social service work that you did. That was um, extremely multi-ethnic. I have a question for you. The question is: Did you yourself witness your, either yourself or other groups, people? Of, of different or same multi-ethnic, same ethnic background as yourself, racism. Have you had that experience of witnessing those types of kinds? Well, of before the military and after the military and oh. during the military, I will say so. It's hard for me. I'm, I'm a different kind of um, uh, character because I am Mexican-American by my heritage. Right. My parents were born of Mexican nationals. Uh -huh. I do speak Spanish, and I sure like tamales <laughs> and burritos. Um, so only one instance in when I was high school, never in the military. I, I guess because I, I did achieve rank that, that I, I really messed with, but I do acknowledge that there was prejudice, and, and if you say racism within the ranks, and, I, and I'll tell you what, before, during, and in the future, it's going to exist, sir. I will tell you right now, I have no doubt that it will exist, um, either by individuals being brought up into the world of, of, of the impression of racism, or by their own impression of why people are different. I think it's ethnophobic. And if you don't understand the word, we can Google it. It means somebody's resentment of another person's ethnicity. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't personally uh, subscribe to that, or have I ever heard or experienced it in, in a way I can define the way you're asking that. I just know it exists. I understand. I understand, uh, I believe I heard you say, that you have experience with um, psychological, absolutely uh, psychological um, workups or backgrounds on, on individuals. Can you, would you please share with us some of the different under that umbrella of uh, mental health? When I was. Um a combat engineer, I was approached by the recruiter. I had already had a year of psychology. And he compelled me to re-enlist. And I said, um, I wasn't interested in it, but I didn't use those words. And he said, what can this man's army give you in order for you to achieve your goals? I said, I want to be a counselor. Fort Hunter Liggett, Fort Sam, I mean, excuse me, California. And he promised he would come back if he could do it. And he came back a day later, and he gave me that on OS. It was my passion for my life to be a counselor. My parents did not have college money. So the Army gave me an opportunity to be an under baccalaureate graduate without hardly any effort, paid 85% of that stuff. So I have dedicated my life to that. When I, when I started with a mental health activity, they gave me the opportunity to do multifaceted, multi, to grade, not, not score, the multifaceted personal inventory that they use for psychological assessment. Uh, they allowed me to do the personal interviews with all those individuals who were going to see the, the na uh, naval and the army psychologists on our, our um, installation. So I was the pre-interviewer of those, and I thought it was very exciting. It was also the prelude to my career as a counselor. I did not achieve doctorate. I'm not a, I'm not a psychologist, uh, but I think I'm a hell of a counselor, and I think I've helped a lot of people, and I have to the tune of about probably close to 70, 80,000 people since 1983 that I've interviewed. They, the claim is death, um, you know, um, just every, everybody, including, you know, when I was a civilian after my, my term in the military, I took on um, a group that were Al-Anons, and that, that's a group of uh, um, family members, specifically spouses of those who are alcoholic. And I thought it was hard enough to, to counsel my addicted soldiers and other people in that, uh, for that purpose, but, but the hardest is the effects of the family. 
And those are the things I was also experiencing in the Army. I didn't know at the time, but it really led me to, to where I am today. And that's why in the American Legion, specifically, we are family-oriented. We, we need to get these people transcended from their um, military life back to hopefully the, the experiences they had before they left. I don't know if that's possible. And I think spouses and children think it should be possible because they come back and daddy left this way or mommy left this way and how come they're not coming back this way? And that's my job, so to speak. I'm not going to say I'm a correct it. Um, but we're here at the American Legion committed to, to achieve it any way we can. I got the Army Commendation Medal um, in my last year. Um, I was, my mission as the non-commissioned officer in charge of the mental health clinic and the alcohol and drug program in um, Yuma Proving Ground, Yuma, Arizona, is to the health and welfare of 1,500 soldiers that were between 18 and, I don't know, whatever. So you're out in the middle of the desert. I was a test evaluation center. We did Abram, Cobra, Apache, and these people went out in the field and they were testing and evaluating the most expensive equipment in the world and I was their babysitter. <laughs> and so every morning at muster, I was supposed to check their breath and their demeanor and their uh, ability to stand at attention and if they weren't, then they went back to their barracks. But more specifically, I was also instructed to, to teach them things about uh, their domestic situation because there were soldiers out there with families. We were in the desert about 20 miles outside of Yuma, Arizona, and about 100, 106 degrees. Not a lot to do out there, so you know that the bar was probably frequented. And so we're just trying to help them out. And so I implemented a program that was essential in improving the quality of life, not only for the soldiers, but the families. And um, John Omarsh, Jr., I believe his father was a, a general, and he was a secretary of the Army, decided to give me a medal for making sure my soldiers maintained their discipline and um, integrity. Speaking of which, how did you get along with um, officers and your fellow enlisted? Well, um, when, I, when I was there, uh, I was also, I, I feel like I needed to bring my certificates. I was also tasked with the, the race relation in my battalion in Hawaii and okay. subsequently afterwards. And so uh, I've always been known, even in my, 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 my programs today, uh, as the peacekeeper. I always try to have people come up with a solution to what their issues are between each other. I think dichotomies can be uh, resolved, even though we approach resolutions from two different perspectives. So yeah, always. Anybody want to contest that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean it, it, you really have to uh, push my button, and I don't know where that button is, i tell you the truth, but it, it, it's there somewhere. <laughs> um, specifically, PTSD. What has been your experience, your observation, um, during your service time, right up to now, that you still definitely involved? You know, one of the things that you have to be, uh, and I, I, can, I hope I can talk expertly at, on this subject, because PTSD is an equal opportunity. We don't want to throw the D in there unless it needs to be D. It could be PTSD. So mine is minimal. You go from moderate to severe. I'm not in that category. But I will tell you that my understanding of PTSD goes beyond just experiencing myself. Because I'm the guy that looks down the barrel of that uh, with um, veterans who come talk to me about what they're dealing with. And I know that there's a wife and there's a child and other family members who wish it would go away. And it's not. So maybe that's my PTSD. I was, I was sort of bummed. Where were you? I was let out of the Army in Yuma, Arizona, and I stayed. I actually I got two weeks off, and then I went straight to a mental health activity. They hired me on the spot because I was, 
I was the NCOIC of the clinic, and they, I had interaction with the community. I was, I've always been working with the community, even in my military experience, so uh, they already knew who I was, and actually they're kind of waiting for me. But I was kind of sad. I had applied for officer candidate school uh, six months previously and got accepted, and so I was, I was looking forward to becoming an Army officer. And um, uh, my MOS, if you have to understand, I was, I was a behavioral science counselor with shortage all over the military. There wasn't a lot of us. Just like right now with the VA, we can't even have enough counselors if we wanted to. I'm not going to pay them enough anyway. And so they flagged my orders and told me I was going to Germany. And I would have went from the NCOIC of my clinic in Yuma, Arizona, to being a subordinate sergeant in Wiesbaden, Germany, taking, you know, I was already on top of my game, and I was going to be an officer. So I went to my XO and said, sorry, see ya. And that was pretty sad. It's all right, I'm doing it. I'm here. What did you do in the days and weeks after that? <laughs> As I said, I took two weeks off. I was married then, uh, one of uh, three marriages. <laughs> and um, my wife at the time was not satisfied that I wasn't looking for a job. I said, holy mackerel, I just did two tours. Well, it only lasted two weeks. I did, I did bass fishing. And then I got the call, and from that point on, I think I missed 19 days in the first 17 years. Uh, amassing a career as a uh, senior counselor, administrator, um, presenter, both Where? local, um, Yuma, Arizona, um, Jackson, California, Amador County, as a senior counselor there. Went to Reno, Nevada. Um, administrator of the um, uh, jobs program, um, guest speaker at the Native American um, Institute in um, Norman, um, Oklahoma, and in um, Lake Tahoe, California for Native American um, presentations on benzene and inhalants. Uh, guest, um, um, I was a um, I don't know, they give you these guest credentials to be at University of Oklahoma. I was a faculty member for a day. It's pretty cool. Anyway. <laughs> so there's a lot of things I've done along the way that, 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 that resulted from my, my experience in the military class. I, and I also was awarded 13 units toward my degree when I left because it was uh, credentialed by the Association of uh, Junior Colleges. And so that did work. And so I, I've, I've done pretty good over the years. I think the GI Bill paid for all of your education. No, not at all. Uh, I didn't go to college after the Army. I got, I got my education while I was in. And I, I'm still eligible, and I want everybody to know that. You're still eligible forever. Uh, and people would ask me, well, how do you get all this rank? And they grandfathered me in 1984 and my credential. By the time I stopped, I retired that career in 1987, they required master's level. I came in in 1984 with associates. I didn't have to do anything. They grandfathered me but I decided to go away. I had enough. You know that burnout syndrome, come on, man. Right. <laughs> I'm not burnt, I'm after burn. I'm toasted, <laughs> toasted, roasted, and refried. Put a stick in this guy. He is done. Well done, man. Um. Isn't that why I tell people what to do now? Because like, I'm the guy with the knowledge. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, man. I want to say something now, just before we go on. I did want to be in combat. My father was in combat. My brother's in combat. My uncle's in combat. Okay? Well, my brother was in combat era of Vietnam. And I was really disappointed. I got drafted and they canceled it on me. I was 64. And had I not been set back in my second grade, I would have been in Vietnam in 1973, actually, 72. But I missed second grade, and I got held back a year. I get drafted, and then the show ends. Now, I know that's not a glamorous interpretation of why I still went to war. But when you come from a military family, okay, and I have nothing to regret about my military experience. I, I, would, I would tell you, I would not be here if not for the Army. My family did not have the money. I would have never went to school. My, my family and... and, 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 and Citizens in Los Angeles at the time were died from drug abuse, gang violence, or going to prison, and my father was not going to have none of that. 
He was a soldier from the Luzon with a bronze star. Go ahead. I am just as committed as I am today. Josh is back there. When this comes up, it don't come down. And we still are the same thing, and I'm glad you said that, because there's a um, concern about what is a militia and what is not. And that oath says that I am going to defend the Constitution in this country against anybody, foreign and domestic. So no, I have not changed my idea. Right now, I choose to be a, a legionnaire. I've been involved with the legion since I was nine years old. I can remember being on the lap of my godfather, who was Army Air Force. In those days, it, that's what it was called. Uh, one of the, my 13 uncles, I think that was the correct number, that came back. And the, you know, I was telling people, I thought all the kids had legion, you know, Boy Scouts, American Legion Baseball. And, and now it's even less, which I, I'm really, I'm really want to continue the legacy of the American Legion. Because when they made the first caucus in, in 1918 in France, it was about that war and any war that came after that and to serve veterans and to make sure they were okay after they came back. You gotta remember, PTSD and, and um, um, was, not, was called shell shock. And then it went to combat fatigue. I don't care what you call it, it exists. The first clinic it was not the, the Veterans Administration, it was the Mayo Clinic that saw the first 100 soldiers and they were mustard gassed and they had shell shock. And when you come to, into society that it has no information about what that is, well, at least the May, Mayo Clinic decided to address that and later on in 1937 we have the VA hospital system that started and today we have 164 of them. So. Yes. What kind of activities does your folks have? Well, uh, we have a lot of activities. We, of course, we have our, our, our bar and all the vivations in there, but I tell you what, we are community-oriented post. We offer our um, auditorium at very competitive price, if not lower than competitive. Uh, we have a lot of dances. We have events that, that, that contribute to not only um, fundraising, but we want to try to make them fun. We just had one right now, uh, last Saturday, uh, Christmas in July. That particular uh, dance is going to raise money for this, the, the uh, active duty children in our community. The auxiliary is very active with the community. The sons, which is the sons of those individuals who serve, are also have their uh, auxiliary, which they contribute to. Every one of our auxiliaries are family members, and they contributed to post activities like we did this last weekend. And, and it was a very good success, 156 people in our community. Uh, we have, the, where we're at right now is the pavilion out here. We have horseshoes, we have a lot of events, we have rock shows out here. 50-50s, um, bingo is a, a big thing. Uh, the list goes on and on. We're trying to um, work more toward youth uh, activities and family-oriented activities. Um, we're a little bit different here uh, because we're, we're the size we are. We have a lot of room for uh, growth, and we have excellent members that, that are promoting that both in the auxiliary in their leadership, but also in their personal interests. Uh, I'll tell you what's happening right now with the Manatee um, Elementary. Our auxiliary uh, has adopted them as their school, and they're working on it. We're real close to achieving our goal of 100 computers for kindergarten through second grade. Okay, that's just one activity as an example. So I don't know how much more you want to hear about, but where we are community-oriented, okay? Well, I don't know if you, you can get a lot out of that conversation. Uh, the, the one thing about me, though, is I, I am passionate not only about uh, veterans and veterans' uh, services and the families. Um, I, I just wish that our climate in the United States not only would be about unifying. You know, I think maybe rather than get to a lot of rhetoric, when people ask me about political stuff, I tell them adamantly, I'm a legionnaire. I don't have a gender. I don't have an ethnicity. All I have is Americanism. 
And that's the one, number one priority of the American Legion, is to be American. And this other stuff has to stop. Thank you. I have a question for you. Sir. How has the uh, how's your military experience affected your life? I don't think the person, I would be the person I am without having been in the Army. Absolutely. I, I, just, I just can't conceive. You know, people ask me, do you regret anything? Well, other than uh, my marriages? Well, that's a separate conversation. But anyway, not wholly. I'm sorry. I have to apologize for that. My kids are the greatest. Maybe I have some bumps in the marriages, but the kids, if you know my kids, as some people know them, so that, that's probably not a true statement, but I'll tell you what. Uh, I don't know what else I would have done. I would not have been able to get my degree for what I do. I would not have been as successful, and uh, I'm proud of my career uh, achievements, and, and, and the most thing that I'm most proud of is all the 37 years, including my time here with American Legion, has been with integrity and honor, okay? And that came right back from the beginning of being in the military. All right. I want to throw one thing in. My dad, even though he, he uh, didn't have a big vocabulary, his favorite word was tenacity. Uh, I think we're lackluster in that. And the younger guys need to, not the soldiers. Troops are doing a good job. Talk to a guy today, Ron Starr. I think he could be my baby. Not my baby brother, he could be my son. E5, airborne. I think you guys talked to him earlier, huh? Awesome dude, right? You're going to come back and interview my daughter in a couple of years, and you, get, you see somebody awesome. Yeah. Thank you for a great interview. Thank you. And thank you for your service.